GAG stands for glycoxaminoglycan. What staining technique is most helpful in highlighting basement membrane for visualization in light microscopy because of the presence of glycoproteins such as heparin sulfate in the basement membrane? The hint for you is to notice the change in coloration theme that I have provided for you in here and you're gonna see a reddish pinkish sort of hue of the tissues. Well the answer is pass or periodic acid chef. This type of staining is very important in highlighting or identifying the tissues with lots of carbohydrates in them. Glycoproteins are sugary structures. This diagram illustrates the major findings in MPGN type 1. The yellow structure points to a podocyte, which is also known as visceral epithelial cell. Beneath that, you see our basement membrane, which is somehow thickened in this case. Then you see fenestrated endothelial cells. This is our mesangium. And as you can see, there are lots of mesangial immune complex deposits. These deposits extend also into subendothelial positions. Notice how mesangium has extended between the endothelial and the epithelial cells as well. Also notice how these mesangial cells, they have greatly increased in number you may see a red cell within this blood vessel. Also notice that the lumen of the blood vessel has somehow decreased in diameter due to, of course, those immune deposits, expansion of the mesangium, or increased number of the mesangial cells. Let's compare and contrast our type 1 MPGN with type 2. This is a type 2 picture. Notice the characteristic thickened basement membrane. Notice that you don't see any mesangial deposits in here. Notice that likewise, type 1, the mesangial cells, they have greatly increased in size. Notice how our thickened basement membrane has completely filled the distance between epithelial cells and the endothelial cells. So, which of these two pictures belongs to a type 1 and which one to a patient with type 2 MPGN? The picture on the left is for type 2 and the one on the right is for a type 1. You might have heard the term tram track in conjunction with MPGN. What does it really mean? Does it mean this finding? Just kidding. Well, maybe in a sense it is. It is really referring to the basement membrane in MPGN that has track tram appearance in light microscopy, of course, with the help of special staining techniques. Actually, this is how you see the tram track with periodic acid shift staining. The staining method highlights the glomerular basement membrane, the capillary endothelial lamina and the epithelial lamina appear as two distinct membranes in light microscopy giving the loops a tram track appearance. To better see this in our own diagram, let us enlarge this segment of the glomerulus. This is how you see it from right to left you're going to see the epithelial cells, the thickened laminal layer of the epithelial cells. You're going to see the mesangium. You're going to see the thickened lamina of the endothelial cells. And this is going to be the lumen of the blood vessels. This silver staining highlights the double counter, tram tracking, and basement membrane reduplication in MPGN. So as you can tell, two standing methods would help to highlight the basement membrane, the pass and silver staining. 
I guess to begin with, this would have been one of our two coloration themes for our tram track mnemonic. Back to our original case scenario. Which of the following serological findings would you expect in this patient? Low levels of serum complement 3, high levels of complement 3, high levels of IgG, autoantibody against C3 convertase that overactivates the alternate complement pathway, or low levels of C1 esterase that overactivates the classic pathway, and finally low levels of serum complement 2. Before we figure out what is the correct answer, let us review a couple of important concepts. Formerly we said that it is postulated that complement deficiency plays an important role in the pathogenesis of MPGN. What complement deficiency is most commonly involved in this situation? The answer is complement 3. Complement 3 deficiency is very common in MPGN and it is demonstrable in about 75% of the cases. By the way, what is the prognosis of MPGN? As you might have guessed, it is relatively poor despite optimal effects of steroids and immune suppressant therapy. Disease quite often progresses to renal failure. Which of the two patterns of presentation would you expect to see in MPGN? Nephritic or nephrotic pattern? The answer is either or both patterns. But nephritic pattern is by far the most common pattern. Does nephritic or nephrotic pattern of MPGN present in rapidly or slowly progressive manner? They both appear in a slowly progressive pattern. This will also help to differentiate the MPGN from the other important cause of nephritic syndrome, which is the rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, which is another important cause of nephritic syndrome. Again, remember our famous mnemonic of PEG rapidly progresses to ham. Which of the two MPGNs is called dense deposit disease? The answer is type 2. Actually, here is the important question that you might have anticipated, but I left it aside until now for you. Although tram track appearance is characteristic of MPGN, it is not as apparent in one of the two types. Which one is it? You don't see this in type 2. You only see it in type 1 MPGN. So it is only the type 1 MPGN that presents with tram track appearance. Why do we only see it in type 1? Because in type 1, mesangium extends between the podocytes and endothelial cells. Whereas in type 2, we get a dense homogeneous deposition along the glomerular basement membrane and in the mesangium that would not allow the double contour formation. In type 2, you will only see a very thick ribbon-like pattern. You're going to see a thick basement membrane between the epithelial and endothelial cells. And as you could have correctly guessed, the correct answer for our last question was option A, or low levels of serum complement 3, which is an important serological finding in patients with MPGN. The case scenario also states that previously she has been tested positive for serum anti-nuclear antibody. What is the significance of this piece of information? It supports the fact that MPGN has most likely an autoimmune etiology. Name important autoimmune conditions that are associated with ANA. These are systemic lupus, erythematosus, Sjogren's, scleroderma, polymyositis, and rheumatoid arthritis. 
I guess because of the gender and young age of the patient, you may like to keep systemic lupus as your top cause of these ANA antibodies in our patient. If so, then let us answer another important question. Is systemic lupus nephropathy a nephrotic or nephritic syndrome? The answer is that it presents as both conditions, but the nephrotic pattern is by far the most commonly presented pattern. IgA nephropathy is a non-systemic disease associated with mesangial IgA deposits, but several systemic diseases also present with mesangial IgA deposits. Let's name the top four such diseases. One is henoch chanlain purpura that often affects young males. The other is, of course, our systemic lupus erythematosus. Note that some of the systemic lupus patients may have IgA deposits. Then we have ankylosing spondylitis that is due to IgA and more importantly due to HLA B27 deposits. This condition characteristically is more common in men and most likely is accentuated with hypertestosterone level conditions, especially in younger males. And finally, the last important association is dermatitis herpetiformis. Is the reason that they call this condition dermatitis herpetiformis is because it is associated with herpes virus? The answer is absolutely not. If any, this condition is heavily associated with celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. The origin of the term, therefore most likely, is due to resemblance of the skin rash of dermatitis herpetiformis with that of the rash of herpes. This reminds me to remind you of a few other conditions such as celiac disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and HIV that are also associated with IgA nephropathy. What type of deposits would you expect to see in the glomeruli of a patient with SLE nephropathy? The precise answer is any or any combination of IgG, IgM, IgA and complement 3. A patient with a history of systemic lupus erythematosus presents with MPGN and glomerular IgA deposits. Which of the two patterns of MPGN would you expect to see in this patient, type 1 or type 2? The answer is that she most likely has a type 2 pattern, which is a more common pattern essentially in systemic lupus nephropathy. Also another important issue is the fact that in type 1 immune complexes are due to IgG and IgM. These two antibodies activate the classical complement pathway. In contrast, type 2 involves uncontrolled activation of the alternate complement pathway and consumption of complement 3. Therefore, this patient most likely must have a type 2 MPGN due to IgA deposits. This diagram illustrates the two important complement pathways. The classic pathway in red that starts with binding of IgG or IgM antibodies to antigen and as a result causes sequential activation of complements 1 through 4 and the alternate pathway that is much quicker and involves complement 3 activation. Note that either of the two pathways finally activate the common pathway that includes membrane attack complements or MAC complex. Activated MAC has lytic power and attacks cellular membranes of pathogens and mediates both pathogenesis and prevention of immune complex diseases. 
Of course, ongoing activation of the complements and MAC complex in nephrons in nephritic or nephrotic diseases can cause ongoing damage to kidneys filtering ability. Biopsy of the glomeruli and immunofluorescence studies of the deposits in renal diseases show certain patterns of distribution of immune complexes. Which of the following patterns is associated with mesangial deposits? The correct answer is pattern C. I have coined the term fireworks in the sky for this pattern of deposits.